first uh, is, is uh, as it happens, a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society and, is, and an historian, uh, a direct, the director of the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University, whose specialty, and he can contradict me if he wishes, but I think his specialty is, is uh, the history and culture essentially of the Northeast around the time uh, that Edmund March Wheelwright was born. And he'll talk some about uh, the, the world uh, that, that gave birth to Edmund March Wheelwright, Ted Widmer. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Dennis. It's great to be back at this society, uh, which I'm a corresponding fellow. I don't, I don't think I've corresponded very regularly or even been at an event in a few years, and uh, we have a, we've achieved overflow status tonight. So um, congratulations, and thank you to all the Harvard Lampoon alums swelling our ranks. For most of us, uh, Wheelwright is known exclusively for his work on the Harvard Lampoon Castle. Tonight we'll hear a lot about his work on other buildings, but. As I did preliminary research, I think we all did, I looked to the great um, multi-volume biographical reference source from the 1930s, the Dictionary of American Biography. I was a little surprised to see that he had an entry because I don't think of him as being that famous. And that entry listed many of his Boston buildings, all the school buildings, uh, Lars Anderson Bridge, the Pepper Mill Bridge, uh, some of the buildings in this part of town, and conspicuously failed to mention the building we're all here to hear about, the Harvard Lampoon Castle. So he still is, has a capacity to surprise us. Um, I want to talk in the eight minutes, I believe I have, uh, allotted to me, about the Wheelwright family in early New England history. There are many New England families. There are many categories of Brahmin families. In fact, really, it's a, an extremely vague term. There are commercial families. Um, mercantile families, industrial revolution families, and the Wheelwright families are truly one of the oldest and strangest of the New England families. <laughs> um, they are right here at the beginning in the 1630s. Uh, the Winthrop papers are here and the Wheelwright family was here nearly coevally with the Winthrops and unlike the Winthrops, they were in trouble from, from nearly the, the beginning of their appearance on the, on the printed page. Um, the progenitor, which if we could show uh, the Reverend John Wheelwright, um, not a humorous looking fellow, <laughs> he attended uh, Cambridge University, class of 1614, and there are only two quotations about him uh, from that time, and they're both good. Cotton Mather, who was the self-appointed historian of much of early New England, said, when Wheelwright was a young spark at the university, he was noted for a more than ordinary stroke at wrestling. And uh, Oliver Cromwell, the great uh, Lord Protector of England in the 1650s, winner of many bloody battles to achieve that status, uh, attended university with Wheelwright, and he said, I remember the time when I was more afraid of meeting Wheelwright at football than I have been since of meeting an army in the field, for I was infallibly, infallibly sure of being tripped up by him. Now, in addition to um, cheating, basically, at sports, Wheelwright <laughs> had a, a strong tendency to argue and to dispute theology. In other words, he was a natural Puritan. Um, the Puritans didn't get along well with the Anglicans, but he, in fact, didn't get along with his fellow Puritans either. Uh, in 1633, for reasons that remain obscure, he was ordered silenced by the church he was working at in England. and. Uh, we don't know the reasons, but he was told to simply stop speaking. <laughs> and unsurprisingly, he decided to emigrate to the New World. He arrived here in the summer of 1636, an auspicious year for many reasons, of founding Harvard University. The declared intention to found Harvard University it was actually founded in 1638. And uh, right away, he got into trouble. Um, he w began to criticize the pretty um, inchoate social order that Winthrop was trying very hard to form, uh, a, a rule, a, an order in which people were supposed to listen to the rules of their betters and follow carefully prescribed uh, rules and regulations. And Wheelwright said, no, I don't choose to follow any of these rules. I completely disagree with them. And he uh, got into, involved in what was the great crisis of the first generation of Massachusetts, the antinomian controversy of 1637 which some of you may have uh, had painfully taught to you at Harvard University uh, in English 70. And the leader of that clique 
was a woman named Anne Hutchinson, after whom the Hutchinson Parkway is named. She was um, beheaded by Indians near, near that highway. Uh, she and Wheelwright were brother and sister-in-law. Wheelwright had married her sister, and they were part of a group of people, family network from Lincolnshire. And the city of Boston is actually named after a city very far in northern England, not at all near London in uh, Lincolnshire. And they didn't like the way these uh, other English people were telling them to mind their own business. And so they began to dispute everything from theology to, um, to ways of conducting their lives. And they had a tendency to argue, especially on Thursday nights, which I mentioned for the benefit of the Harvard Lampoon <laughs> contingent. <laughs> And in January 1637, Wheelwright gave an excoriating speech, attacking every known source of authority. And uh, for that speech, he was banished out of Boston, anywhere he could go that wasn't Boston. So for the second time in his life, he was silenced. And you could either go south to where I live in Rhode Island, where the other troublemakers had been sent, or north. He went north to Exeter, New Hampshire. He founded Exeter. And he ultimately went all the way to Maine, to Wells, Maine, and helped to found that part of New England. And uh, for a long time, the Wheelwrights, his branch, lived in Wells, Maine. Uh, if I could show the next slide, I want to, it's simply a headstone. And his son was named John Wheelwright, also Colonel John Wheelwright. He fought against the Indians. This was right on the northern frontier. There were constant Indian attacks. And it's a very unusual gravestone. So I include it simply for the fact that this, I've never seen a grave marking like this. It's a man holding a piece of paper a uh, sign of uh, the value of the printed word, obviously, and, and perhaps a future symbol to uh, lampoon alums always seeking for them. Uh, J Colonel John Wheelwright had a daughter who may be the most unusual person in the history of colonial New England, and we're lucky to have, do, do we have a slide of Esther Wheelwright? We do. And if you look behind Harry Cobb, uh, kinsman of Edmund Wheelwright, you'll see the original painting. It's a very important painting on an easel behind Harry Cobb from about 1760, a very crude painting. And the story of Esther Wheelwright, she was born in 1696 in Wells, Maine. And at age seven, she was abducted by Abenaki Indians in an Indian raid. There were constant Indian raids. And she was taken by the Indians, and she became Indian, as so many young English children they had no choice, and they were raised by Indian families, and she became a Native American for all intents and purposes, until she was discovered by a French priest who abducted her a second time and took her to Quebec City, where she entered the Ursuline Convent, which is still a very uh, reputable convent in Quebec City. And in 1714, she took her order. She became a nun, and her, changed her name to Sister Esther Marie Joseph de l'Enfant Jésus. Um, so Esther Wheelwright became a French-Canadian nun and ultimately the mother superior of this great historic order in Quebec. And in 1759, the great battle over whether North America would become French or English took place outside Quebec. And the general, General Montcalm on the French side was mortally wounded and she nursed him, uh, not to health evidently, but to, uh, he, he died. Um, and Interestingly, two of her nephews were fighting on the English side in the same battle. And throughout these 60 years that she'd been away, her family kept trying to get her to come back. And she never did. She stayed French. But to this day in Quebec in the Ursuline convent, there's a silver service with the wheelwright coat of arms. The family kept sending things up to her. And she just said, no, I, I like it here. So that would merely be obscure historical information if it weren't for the fact that Edmund March Wheelwright was extremely interested in this history. And he wrote history, which I did not know. From, for most of us, the source of Wheelwright knowledge is uh, Sam Van Dam's uh, undergraduate thesis on the Lampoon Castle. And I just went to the Brown University Library where I found not only a copy of a book by him, but it appears to be his son's copy. The, the Wheelwright family, uh, his daughter Louise, ended up marrying a Brown University professor. And so there are several Wheelwright books in the Brown Library. And uh, this book, A Frontier Family, by Edmund March Wheelwright, was written in 1894, just as he was starting his career as Boston City architect. And it's filled with uh, very good historical information and a lot of personal asides. And he said that um, Esther Wheelwright especially fascinated him. And a very elderly family member in his lifetime had shown him trinkets from her life. So. This may seem like a long time ago. She's born in 1696, but um, memoranda of her life were available to the young Edmund March Wheelwright as he was learning to become a historically informed person. And we all know he was a historicist architect drawing deeply on Holland and 
other forms of architecture, but he was really very strong on history too. And I want to end with two slides I, I saw the other day in the faculty club of Brown University. There are a lot of not very good paintings of um, Brown faculty members from the early 20th century, and I looked up and this is S. Foster Damon, who was the husband of Wheelwright's daughter, Louise, and he was uh, uh, an expert on William Blake and the obscure symbols hidden between the artwork of, of William Blake. And if you look closely at the signature, and as the next slide shows it, it's, uh, the painting is by Wheelwright's daughter, Louise Wheelwright. So out of all of this, what do you get? You get a strong interest in historical research, uh, a tendency to subversion, uh, and a predilection for completely losing it on Thursday nights. And that's the, uh, the beginning of Edmund March Wheelwright. Thank you.